Welcome to Hello Church. I'm Justin Trapp. I'm White Beard, and this is episode 53. And I love the title of this episode. It's going to make a few feathers ruffle. <laughs> Mega Church Secrets for Small Churches. Oh, man. And before. Yeah, we're going somewhere. Yeah, before you exit out of this video or type a hasty comment yeah i just want to let you know that we're going to be offering some ideas that small churches yes. already utilize but as we were thinking about this topic uh, we thought to ourselves what do a majority of bigger churches do that maybe smaller churches struggle with yeah and so you might say oh our our church is smaller however you define smaller but we're already practicing some of these principles that's great there might be some here that maybe you haven't thought of yet and i think we want to do an episode yeah no, small don't, church don't get comfortable mega churches small church secrets yeah. for mega churches yes and that'll be coming here probably in the next month or so yeah but um i think these secrets uh could be very helpful so just keep keep an open mind yeah so when i was in seminary I was volunteering at a small church. Now, I had the opportunity to to be a part of a leadership team on a large church, mm -hmm. and then it was had an opportunity for a very very small church. The youth group was like a dozen kids, mm -hmm. and I was asking my mom. I said, "Mom, which one should I do?" I I, I grew up in the the large church environment. We grew up in a large mega church. Um, and I, that's my comfort zone. And my mom said, you know, Justin, uh, and she, I don't know, you know, my mom's theology is really simple sometimes. And she said, Justin, Jesus changed the world with 12 disciples. Mm -hmm. So maybe you should go do that. And I was like, I guess so, mom. You know. <laughs> and so I went there and, and I served for, for a year while I was in, in seminary under this youth pastor. And I noticed this thing, though, about the youth pastor. He was always very critical of the mega churches, and I think mm -hmm. it, it came from a place of, of insecurity, uh, where you know he was the youth. He'd been at the church for many years, right? And he he always would say, "I've been I've been in youth ministry for twenty years," and blah blah blah. And, and then he you know, sort of cursed the you know the the large youth group down the road. Not curse. Uh, that's a bad. Uh, he'd he'd slander the the, the mm -hmm. large youth group mm -hmm. down the road. And I had this thought. I said, you know, because he always used to throw that out. I had twenty years of experience. I've had mm -hmm. twenty years of experience, and in that year that I was under him, I realized he had had probably a year of experience just twenty times. Oh, he had he hadn't got past that first year, and so I think. You know, we we talk to, to pastors at smaller churches all the time, and and I've we've served in, in a smaller church oh, as well. Yeah. We've, we we serve right now in a church plant, and there are lessons and there are dynamics at play that, um, like you said, that a lot of the smaller churches you're going to be doing some things that we're talking about, but there are some lessons and principles that mega churches have figured out on an organizational level, on an architectural mm -hmm. level. Doesn't mean they're more spiritual than you. It doesn't mean they're more blessed than you. It just means there are some, some organizational dynamics that they've been able to figure out and make a little bit more efficient. And maybe they can actually help mm -hmm. you get to the next season with your congregation and your sort of structure, your leadership structure. So yeah, we, 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 our intent today is for these to be helpful, uh, not necessarily put you, you know, <laughs> in a defensive posture. Yeah, and I, I don't think that every church needs to be huge. I sure, think that of course. God uses different churches for different individuals. Absolutely. I was attending a big church. You could call it a mega church a few years ago, and I really felt like I needed to be a part of a smaller congregation, mm -hmm. and they're both great, Yes. but I feel like that's where God needed me. So when we say smaller, there are a lot of people mm -hmm. who approach that and say, oh, smaller is not as good, and then other people say smaller is better. I think it just, it all it all depends yeah. on being faithful, mm -hmm. and, and like you said, growing. You know, maybe that youth pastor just needed to invest in those 12, 20 kids, but they could have done it more faithfully if they would have really worked to grow in the knowledge of God and the experience that he's given them wisdom. So we're going to give these, uh, it's a lot of disclaimers, yeah. we're going to offer some of these tips and I guess we can go ahead and jump in and as always, let us know what you think in the comments. Don't be 
too hurtful to us, <laughs> our fragile egos. <laughs> but but let it, let us know uh, things that have worked for you and maybe how we can continue this con- uh, conversation. Listen, we talk to pastors a- a- every week of the year, right? Yeah. That are at smaller or, uh, churches, but numerically speaking, and they want to do more, right? Mm-hmm. They want to grow. They want to be able to add members to their team, mm-hmm. and and. Really, a, a lot of the way that you do this is by growing and adding more disciples to your congregation and to your community, and then giving goes up, and so you're able to do more. Um, and so, if that's your desire, um, maybe some of these can, can help. So l- let's let's dive right in. One of the things that we've seen mega churches do a lot is really invest into the public square, mm-hmm. be involved, uh, not just in the com- you know in your local community, but but be involved. Um, you know, you have uh, you have city council. You have what's the the business um, the uh, chamber of commerce. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, let your church be a resource for the chamber of commerce. If they're going to host a chamber of commerce meeting, if they're going to, there's all kinds of local business groups in your community. I imagine as well, depending on what city you live in or what part, what type of uh, area you live in, where. Um, instead of them renting a room at a hotel, allow them provide a conference room at your church for them or provide the auditorium mm-hmm. for, for local business leaders to meet. Be a sort of a hub, right, for the leaders, the political and business leaders of your community. Um, we see a lot of mega churches doing this and a large large churches doing this. And if you have the mm-hmm. facilities, you know, it, it can make sense. If you don't have the facility and you're meeting in a, in a public school because you're a church plant, you know, it's probably not the, the right uh, point for you, but nonetheless. Yeah, but I mean, uh, what I love about our church that meets in a school is they've taken time to get to know the people at their school, mm-hmm. and pretty regularly they'll come to the congregation and they say, "Hey, we were talking about talking to the vice principal, yep. and there are these three families that need help. Yep. Uh, find an opportunity to do that." You don't have to have a church of thousands of people to to get to know your mayor. Uh, to get to know the people in your city council, um, the chamber of commerce, be yeah, like Justin said, be a resource for those individuals. And what I what I also love about what our church has done is every year our little community would do an Easter egg hunt, mm-hmm. and we've actually merged yeah. the community Easter egg hunt with the church Easter egg hunt. And so they give us some resources and they push people our way. And I think that's really a cool opportunity. It helps us, but it also helps the community, and yeah. they love to do it. So find those unique opportunities, invest in the public square, and be creative about it. Anytime you have uh, influencers, <clears throat> right, whether it be politically or, or business-wise, uh, you, you want to you want to be able to serve them because you never know who is coming into your you know your facility right and having yeah. a business meeting with some other business leaders or you know, uh, some, you know mayor or city council whatever the case may be you never know who comes into your property into your campus and sees what you're doing and sees the the how how your church is serving them and you never know what kind of mm-hmm. um, uh, Donation someone may send one day, mm-hmm. uh, just out of the blue, right? Uh, that could change the trajectory, right, of your church budget for for the next few years. You just never know. And anytime you can provide uh, an environment for for the leaders in your community to have a space, and you can serve them, um, not only does it give you influence and opportunity, but but it could pay dividends down the road. Another yeah. and, and don't underestimate how many local events need pastors to pray before the local yes. events. Yes. It's kind of crazy. Like I've prayed before a city council meeting because they just had somebody pray. And marathons, they'll often have people pastors, local pastors pray. Just never just don't underestimate that and just be willing to just pray publicly and you'll get invited to spaces. It's kind of fascinating. One time I had a uh, I was in San Antonio, I was on I was a youth pastor and I think the priest or the the the, the local priest in the area of the Catholic the Catholic Church was unavailable down the road, and so they called the church, and the the boys were doing a baseball tournament, mm-hmm. and so they wanted me to pray over the boys, mm-hmm. and so I, I didn't know what to expect, and these these 
this uh, baseball team, none of the people really came to our church. They just knew of our church. So they mm-hmm. called. So I, on a Sunday afternoon, I came back up at the church. These boys in their baseball uniforms are sitting on the front row. And the, yeah. one of the guy, the coach said, hey, you know, just say something, you know, like inspirational to okay, the, yeah, to the yeah, kids. Yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah. like, okay. So I fell for it. And I tried to say something inspirational to the kids. And like, you know, they're just like chewing bubble gum, looking up. And finally, I was like, <laughs> I just got to get this show on the road, right? And... Uh, I just said a simple prayer. I said, you know, it's not, you know, winning. I shouldn't have said this, right? The coach is not very happy about this. I said, winning isn't the important, but the most important thing is that, <laughs> that you have a great attitude, right? And, and and if you find yourself with a bad attitude, ask God to help you, you know, to to redirect that. And so then I prayed for them, and they even tipped me. They gave me a $20 tip, what? and I was just like, what is happening? I just prayed. It's such over, a weird situation. I prayed over a baseball team. Uh, anywho. Um, but you, you get opportunities like that, and and I thought about that, like, while it was weird, you know, what if one of the families, right, they haven't been in this church in years and something happens or their their marriage is struggling. All of mm-hmm. a sudden, that 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 young man that prayed for their son's baseball team, maybe they think of our church when they are looking for help, essentially. Yeah. And so you always want to be a resource. The other thing you want to do is you want to invest in the digital public square. Yeah, and we've talked about this a bunch because, I mean, 2020 – reminded us of that and i i do think it's important that people still gather together physically that's yeah. that's vital but people are on social media all the time and we can see how social media influences us in so many different directions and so if you can take digital media resource tools and kind of meet people where they are and uh, it can be so helpful and we see a lot of larger churches doing this and that's where we see the ads and that's where we see the videos but there's no reason that you can't do that as well to help people know about your community of faith and to get people involved yeah if you are a smaller church and you have a social media presence. I want to challenge you with this. I want you to think about social media differently. Now, when you look at some of the, the the tactics and the strategies that larger churches are using, it may look flashy, right? You may, when you see their video, you, you may see all the lights and the screens, or you know, all, all the technology that they have. But I, I want you to think about their videos a little differently. I can't tell you. I mean, we're we're, we're friends with lots of pastors, right? Yeah. Um, lots of pastors on Facebook have. And I can't tell you how many times I'll just see a pastor post his message online and like, that's it. Like no comment. It's just like the stream post. Yeah. And you have to remember that Facebook, like people don't watch, uh, videos on like an hour long video. They watch 30 second videos. And so what we're seeing is a lot of the larger churches have begun to adopt that they're realizing that the habits of people on the different social media platforms are different. The way people consume content on Instagram is different than Facebook. The way they consume content on Facebook is different than they would on your website if they're just watching a service. And so you've got to be respect the platform in which you're trying to publish content. And remember that if you're just posting a stream of your service that's an hour long on Facebook, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but that should not be, you shouldn't pat yourself on the back after you do it and feel like, oh, I've, we've, we've done our, our mm. good deed for the week online. You know, we're, we're nailing it on social media. You want to create content or take your hour long stream service and, and, and cut it up edit it so that there's a 60 second clip of you sharing a sermon illustration in the application point or a three minute clip of one of your worship songs if you have you know the ccli license or the facebook license yeah. whatever but 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 create content publish content be consistent but do it in a way that aligns with the way that people are consuming content online that i think that's the important part don't just throw your stream up because yeah. it's not going to get you a lot of engagement yeah and i let me give you a good example of this, maybe a bad example. Bad example would be uh, just to take a clip from your message that's super inspirational. It feels like a complete thought. You post it on there. People like it, and they feel, quote, unquote, inspired. It, I, I don't know if that's the best way to go about it, but I saw on a positive example uh, the Village Church years ago, and I don't know if the Village Church posted this or someone just pulled it off of Matt Chandler's sermon, but they pulled off a section where he's talking about fatherhood and parenting. And he told the dads, he was like, hey, you need to like go to bed really tired because you need to go to work and you need to do everything for the glory of God. And then you need to come home 
and you need to invest in your children and invest in your spouse. And when you go to bed, you're tired because you've done everything, like I mentioned, to the glory of God. And I thought it was a really great clip and it encouraged me to go back and listen to the full message and to really, really try to live that out. And so if if you are producing clips, try to create um, that taste that would encourage people to dig into God's word or to watch the rest of the message or to hopefully look up your church and visit um, versus just saying, oh, wow, I got my dose of inspiration for today and I'm done. And so think through those clips, but definitely you have to invest in the digital public square. And then I think another thing that, that bigger churches do well is the way that they use their property. And you mentioned host non-church events at your church. Um, but when you think about your church property, think about how you can build or maintain it or set it up to where people are coming on the property during the week. And we've known churches that have put together ball fields, uh, splash pads, find opportunities to get people to come to your church during the week and use it as an opportunity for the community to gather together. And I think that's going to be a big win for you and your congregation. Yeah, if you have a large parking lot in, in your church and there's a natural disaster, it can be a staging area, mm-hmm. right? For uh, whether it be FEMA or like there's an organization called Convoy of Hope. They yeah. just actually partnered with a smaller church in our area yeah. when the, we had this big freeze. Um, use your, your facilities, right, for as a response a unit or a response location to, to, to a natural disaster or something like that. But also during during the week, right? Every day you can set up ball fields um, if you have the have you have the, the space to do it. Mm. And I'd like to challenge us with this thought. I feel like the, the common wisdom way has been at least at least in, in our area in our yeah. denomination that we kind of grew up that the common wisdom was you, you buy a piece of property, right? Mm. You save up maybe you're planning a church or you're in a church re- revitalization, you, you save up lots of money for years, you buy a piece of property, and then you save up a lot more money for a lot more years, and then you build a building. Mm-hmm. And then that's kind of like you've arrived, right? Yeah. And that may take seven, eight, ten years. Uh, and I think it's great to own land, don't get me wrong, but one of the things you could do is, uh, I had a pastor friend of mine uh, in Dallas, he... The, the church saved up enough money and just buying a piece of the land that's going to sit there for many years it, it, it's it's an asset but it's kind of a non it's like a passive asset mm-hmm. uh, they bought a, an office complex a building right and they converted about 80 percent of that office complex in a church facility so they they met there for their services then the nursery kids all that and then the other 20 percent they rented out to local businesses the the 20 percent paid the note on the rest of the 80%. And then, so that, that becomes an active asset, a, a cash flow yeah. asset that allows you to then in turn um, do other things with your budget so you can go further faster. If you in, take all of your money and you just put it into a slab of land and then that sits there for the next six years, you, you're really um, almost taking the long route in a lot of ways. And there are, mm-hmm. other, there, there are ways to solve problems as a church. And I know a lot of times churches, you don't view yourself as a business. And so like talking about cash flow yeah. and making money and having tenants feels a little weird, but I think you can actually do some really cool things with your church property. And here's this too. Mm-hmm. Let's say you let's say um, you do have some property, maybe you have some frontage property, um, and you sell that to a, a, a national change or something. Now, now you have people right in front of your property seven days a week, mm-hmm. and not just one day a week. Yeah. Um, they're all different creative ways. We have a, we have a pastor friend of ours. Um, he had someone donated a backstop to the church, and so he put it up at their church. And now they have practices, baseball practices mm-hmm. and softball practices, like f- four times a week. Yeah, and. He's got. He's built. Been able to build relationship with coaches, and he's not even at a larger church. He's at a smaller church, yeah. but the conversations that he's having um, with some of the 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 coaches and the families and the parents in the area has been very fruitful for for their church, just because he's been a resource to the community. Yeah. So there's all different kinds of ways. Yeah, and I, you know, 
it, it, it's outside the box or maybe you have that piece of land and I've even thought you know what if pastors before they build a church built a little shopping center or something at the front yeah first and they rented that out and they took the profit that they were mm-hmm. making the cash flow every month and started building and so you're getting people on the property they're they're aware of your church yeah. and it's also another asset it's cash flow every month so there are creative ways to do that I mean it's just it's fascinating and I, I'm, I'm too I'm all about the aesthetics I think that when you look at these cathedrals um, sometimes they can be gaudy but a lot of times they direct our worship to the heavens and so thinking through that as you produce your building I, I think can be super helpful uh, I, I also want to point out as we talk about mega church ideas um, and this is a problem that some bigger churches can have but we'll just kind of go with it don't don't act like a small organization. So here's when I think of a small organization, I think of a limited number of people kind of doing everything. Yeah. And if it's not managed well, and you might manage your your leadership team well, but if it's not managed well, what happens is everybody is scrambling all the time. Yeah. And when you're scrambling all the time, you can't ever sit back and see things from the big picture and you're not planning in advance. It's you, like you're um, working in the business, not on the business. <laughs> right. Well, you, 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 if you um, if you watch interviews or look at the schedules for like big touring music artists, they have things planned out a year or two years in advance. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that can change versus someone who's just starting in the industry and they're just trying to get a gig. Yeah. And I think for us, we need to start planning more in advance so we can be focused in where we want to go so remember to keep that in mind and and don't wait for growth to get your leadership team set uh start working on that now i think that's super important well we've talked about this before and i've talked about this uh, as a matter for you pastor as the leader uh to designate your time if you had to quantify your time and you had to say hey this is the, like this for me I did it in like hourly because I was doing a lot of freelance and consulting at the time so a thousand dollar an hour task meaning only only the thing that you can do a mm. hundred dollar an hour task meaning a specialized skill like not everyone can do it certain people can and then the ten dollar an hour task which I would designate for for church world a volunteer could do I would I would challenge you to do this and I would challenge your team to do this everyone on your leadership team and your pastors on staff everyone needs to be honest with themselves and say what do I do list out everything that they do yeah list out everything that you do in a given week it whether it's you have to hop in. I got to be at this meeting. That's every week. Or I've got to do this. Or someone expects me to send them this every week. Mm-hmm. List all that out. And then be honest with yourselves and say, what could a volunteer do? What, what that I'm over, what am I doing? Could someone else on my team do? And then uh, for the your team leadership, what could a volunteer take off their plates? So that you can not only multiply your leadership, but you can also have your leaders be focusing on the most important things, not necessarily just being busy. And I think that's yeah. a, that's an important thing to 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 note. Yeah, and I think in small organizations, uh, business, church, there can be not always, but there can be this propensity that everything goes through the the main leader. Yeah, every decision, and what you need to do is create a a tiered level. And you need to have your department heads, your leaders, be able to make decisions. Now, you're there and you're communicating the vision and you're checking in and you're saying, this is where we want to go. But give people an opportunity to create that vision for their own departments and to make decisions. And so that's what you see in bigger organizations because they just have to do that. But there's also some principles there that I think are going to help smaller churches as well as they try to lead and and to really pursue where God is, is trying to take them. Uh, my last point on on all this, and I think mega churches do this pretty well, um, and largely because they have the facilities to, to do this. But also, I think they have a realization that not everyone that comes to your church, or not everyone that passes by your church, just wants to hop in a Bible study or a small group and watch a message, right? Uh, the, that ultimately is where you want them to end up, right? You want them to end, hear the gospel. And you want them to experience community, godly uh, discipleship, making community. But sometimes 
finding common ground with people doesn't start in the book of Luke, right? Maybe maybe it starts somewhere with an interest. So like we did talk about having you know uh, baseball teams come practice at your church, but maybe you can do maybe you can have small groups, but maybe that their interests they're sort of like the entry level. Mm-hmm. So uh, our church we had a softball small group, and there was actually about half the team that played on the small on uh, on the softball team didn't necessarily they weren't like faithful attenders at our church. Yeah. We ended up having three softball teams at our church, and we were a smaller church. Um, but it was such a great way to get people in the door, right? Mm-hmm. Relationship building, and then you progress them. You make the invite. You know, every, you, the people on that are faithful attenders need to know, like, this isn't the last stop for these these guys and gals that were playing. We had a co-ed team, too. Uh, that, you know, invite them to your small group that, that you go to. You know, have them over for dinner. Invite them to a service. We, we're doing a special Father's Day uh, weekend. Invite them. Um there are ways that you can reach out to people in your community where they might not want to just come straight to a service and hear a sermon, but 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 eventually they'll get there if you can start and you can find mm-hmm. common ground somewhere, some way. And so maybe you could do an interest-based small group or you have different, again, like sports and activities on your property if you have the property. Well, those are some ideas, uh, hopefully some some principles that we've kind of seen and our team has helped us to kind of as we research this topic. So I'm hoping that whether you are at a larger church or smaller church, some of those ideas will help you. And we're going to be working on our sequel to this. Larger churches, you're not off the hook. There yeah. are things that you need to learn from smaller churches, and we're going to get into Maybe that. they forgot, right? Maybe they forgot. They must the, have forgot. The success has taken you out of the game. Uh, if you have any comments, make sure to tag us or use the hashtag uh, Hello Church Pod. You can also leave a comment if you're watching this on YouTube. Let us know your thoughts. Uh, tweet us your takeaways. Next episode, we're going to be talking about memorable Mother's Day church services. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy that episode for big churches and small churches. Small yeah, it's, churches. A, it's a great ideas episode. Yeah. We love our ideas episodes. We got Uh, at least 10 Mother's Day ideas for you. So check it out. We'll see you next time. We appreciate you guys. This is Hello Church.